Welcome to the Voice of Salvation programming, whose main source is to be an inspiration to you through the message of hope and peace. And this is only achieved when you remain in tune. Stay with us and you will be blessed. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This scripture is one of the most thrilling for all saints in the world. We believe with all our hearts that one of these days the Lord is going to keep His promise and rescue us from this world, this world that is sin-stricken, and to take us to be with Him eternally in a heaven prepared only for those whose hearts are pure. For this cause, we're willing to make the most of our service here in this world, not knowing if we will live to see the coming of the Lord or if we will be among those who will arise from the grave at the last trump. We are like those in ages past who had their hope and trust in God, but who did not see the promise. They live faithful lives and are now at rest waiting for the end of the world. It is impossible for us to know just what the process of changing from the mortal to the immortal and from the corruptible to the incorruptible will be. But we have hope in God that it will be a wonderful transformation. What little we observe in the scriptures of Christ in his glorified body before he ascended to heaven is all that we have upon which to base our knowledge of what this change must be like. Other than this knowledge, we have the assurance that it will be far better than our imaginations can grasp. Whatever the change will be, we may be assured that it will be a glorious one. Many times I've tried and tested as I travel. Of the saints. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 tells us, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. It would be well for those who suffer the loss of loved ones to reconsider the scripture which declares that Christians walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit recalling that the spirit of the deceased has departed to God who gave it, 
and all that remains is the earthly tabernacle which must eventually return to dust. Much of our weeping is from the sense of personal loss. Our loved one can no longer walk and talk with us. He can no longer pray with us and for us. Nor will we ever again be called upon to be of service to Him. All of this has in it an understandable selfishness. In most cases, the departed one has escaped from a prison of the flesh that has housed much suffering and affliction. For his sake, we would not think of calling him back. Yet grief will at times make us rebel so completely against our loss that we appear to want the lost one back regardless of the cost and regardless of his condition. The Apostle Paul warns the Thessalonian saints not to present to the world an implication that there is no hope beyond the grave and that they shall never again see the one now dead. They must take care lest they leave the wrong impression on others and raise doubts concerning the resurrection of Christ, who became the first fruits of them that sleep. There is another thought connected with death, and that is the demise of one about whom there can be no hope for salvation. It is most tragic, and every family sooner or later must face the loss of a loved one whose life leaves no doubt concerning his destination, the lake of fire. Here is truly cause for grief, which only the comfort of the Scriptures and the presence of the Lord can make bearable. Now, if we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read the following verses, 14 and 15. The Apostle Paul writes, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Notice that the apostle refers to the dead as being asleep. And not only asleep, but asleep in Jesus. Here the picture seems to be that of an extended physical rest. One reference elsewhere states that the saint will rest from labor and that his works will follow. We are also reminded of the paradise in which Lazarus found himself after angels had transported his spirit from the rich man's gate to the bosom of Abraham. And Abraham reported to the man in hell that Lazarus is comforted and thou art tormented. Without the resurrection of Christ, the preaching of the cross and all the rest of the gospel would be without foundation. The believer must begin not with the birth of a babe in Bethlehem, but with the resurrection of one slain from the foundation of the earth. What lies between these important events involving the life and teachings of Jesus would be of little value no more in fact than the biography of other great leaders of men had the Savior remained in Joseph's tomb. Beginning with the resurrection of Jesus, the believer can then go back to his teachings and see that they are not only well worth observing because of the benefit to the observer, but they are mandatory since their originator is the Son of God. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul declares that if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Later he said that in Christ shall be made alive. Now coming to the point that live saints shall have no hindering effect on dead saints, we are told that God shall bring these from the grave when he comes to catch away his own. Now, as we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, let us read verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, I know it's hard to imagine how such an audible thing as the second coming of Christ shall occur, as some believe, without the whole world being a witness, such would certainly be impossible unless by divine control that shout and that voice and that trumpet be heard only by those eligible for the rapture. At any rate, for the prepared ones, the shout of the Savior will be the most monumentous and blessed sound they have ever heard or shall ever hear. 
It is a prerequisite to hearing the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now Paul says in that verse, in verse 16, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Here we have Paul's assurance concerning those who precede us in death. Not only shall we not precede their rising, they shall be the first ones directly affected by the Lord's coming. They shall rise as the initial effect of Christ's shout, the call of the archangel, and the sound of God's trumpet. And though this rising shall probably be instantaneous, all else must wait until it is accomplished. Notice that these are new creatures made so by their position in Christ. All things having passed away while they yet lived. There is no on-the-spot redemption, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptizing, or church joining. Having been found dead in Christ, they shall also be found worthy to rise at His coming. The only other mass resurrection will be that of the wicked dead. So those who miss the first must absolutely participate in the second. Now, as we go back to 1 Thessalonians, we'll read verse 17 of chapter 4. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. A beautiful religious song has lyrics to the effect that the singer would like to be standing near his mother's tomb when Jesus comes in the clouds. He would like to say, Mother, this is your boy. You left when you went away. And now, dear mother, it gives me great joy to greet you again today. Now, certainly for us, there is a loved one whom we would like first to see. If we were to continue to think in the natural, yet on the notable day of the rapture, all will probably be attracted to the events transpiring in the skies, rejoicing to look upon the face of him who has now come to catch away his bride, the one who suffered and died, that believers might have the right to rapture. Now mortal tongue or pen can never hope to describe what shall occur, and once it has happened, morality for the saint shall have been swallowed up in immorality, and there will be no further need for description or attempts at evaluation. We should also notice that no preference is to be given the life over the dead. Now, we shall all be changed in a moment, Paul said, in the twinkling of an eye, and be caught up together as high as the clouds where we shall meet the Lord. Now, I want you to notice that we shall not at this time come entirely to earth. Now, this is reserved for his return with the saints, when his feet shall first touch the Mount of Olives, to single the beginning of the greatest quake in history of mankind, the start of the battle of Armageddon, for the overthrow of Satan's kingdom on earth. Now, as we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we continue to read in verse 18. Paul says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Many last rites for the righteous dead have been marked by rejoicing on the part of those who love them most. They were able to have joy through faith in the resurrection, knowing that death is not the end of it all. It is only a short separation between life and eternity. They are promised a time of reunion at the coming of Christ, a togetherness such as the world has never known, a fellowship which shall have no further interruptions. There is no denying the recognition of a physical loss, but there is also no doubting of the promise that because he lives, we shall live also. David declared that he could not bring his son back to life, but that he could one day go to be with him. In this, God is no respecter of persons. The reward of David is also the reward of all who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. However, we must not evaluate heaven entirely on its reuniting properties. It would not be heaven at all were it not for the fact that we shall ever be with the Lord. Now, the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 6 tells us, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Marriage should be a time of rejoicing. When bride and groom and well-wishers are greeted, 
that the union about to be consummated is as it should be, and nothing but happiness is anticipated. Such occasions also call for wonderful music describing the beauty of the bride and the purity of love. However, no man has ever conceived sufficient words to adequately describe the great affection of Christ for his church, the Lamb for his bride, nor the perfection, without spot and without blemish, which shall be hers on that long-awaited occasion to which all time has pointed. Notice that the number of people making up the well-wishers was such that their voices raised in praise at the sound of many waters, the roar of a mighty thunder. They rejoiced not only for the fact that the Lord was reigning, but at the arrival of the hour when the bride had made herself ready for the marriage with the Lamb. There's no reference at this time to the price paid for the bride, nor the price she has paid for preparation. Yet the conclusion of this has been reached and all heaven sings its approval. Now, if we go back to the book of Revelations, chapter 19, we'll read in verse 8 the following. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Elsewhere in God's word, we are told that Christ shall present to himself a bride that is perfect in every detail, clean and white without spot or wrinkle. And those who accept to become a part of this bride must begin with the righteousness of saints, made possible by the blood of the Lamb, which is required to wash away sin. Now, no one is eligible for membership until he has come the way of the cross, trusting Christ for salvation and helping to make himself ready by walking in the light as it shines on his path. Holiness without which no man shall see God is as much a part of the holy right as God so loved the world. Thus, we are quick to realize that sinlessness is a prerequisite to acceptance with the Lamb who shall soon come to catch away his own. As we continue to read Revelation chapter 19, verse 9 tells us, And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Blessed are they which are called. Here we have more than an invitation to be saved, with many called and few being chosen. Here are all those honored with a call to be present for the marriage of the Lamb and the church. They have made themselves ready, having sought and received through Christ's eligibility to wear the proper garments, the robes of righteousness, required not only of the bride, but of all the guests at the ceremony. Now, few weddings and no formal ones are performed without bridal parties that involve from a few to many participants, with hundreds sometimes being invited to attend the reception where it is proper to wish every happiness to the guest of honor. Now, this will be the greatest event of the heavenly scheduled of the raptured saints. God bless you.